Hello. I am William Calvin, a professor emeritus at the University of Washington's Medical School in Seattle. I am going to talk about why the climate fix now needs to be big and quick. There are important lessons to be learned from from the extreme weather surge. Extreme weather has created a climate emergency, not so much through current damage but because of the lead time required to cool us off by removing the excess carbon dioxide from the air overhead. There are important lessons to be learned from the extreme weather surge. Most of the four half-hour parts of this series are likely to be new to you as they involve a different way of looking at the climate problem, one which assumes there will be a series of global economic crashes caused by the further surges in extreme weather. This could happen long before global average surface temperature reaches 1.5 degrees Celsius of overheating. Such is the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement's notion of when we get into big trouble. This series will, I hope, convey my sense of how much sooner big trouble could arrive. Or already has. As my series title says, extreme weather has created a climate emergency. Since about 2003, it has been like watching a slow motion train wreck in progress. So, let me start by introducing the four talks in the series. Part 1. After this series intro, the rest of this talk today, and some of the second, addresses the question, what's the emergency? The creep in overheating that has been our focus for 40 years is, by itself, rather slow to constitute a drop everything else emergency. It is overheating's knock on causes, which created a surge in five types of extreme weather between 2002 and 2010, that has become an emergency. These secondary knock-ons do not track global mean temperature. Indeed, all surged during a 10-year hiatus in the warming trend when some claimed that global warming had stopped, despite the continuing rise in excess carbon dioxide during the hiatus. Next week, I will finish part 1 by reviewing what the jet stream loops are thought to contribute to these extreme weather surges. Then, I will go on to Part 2 What to do about this emergency? Our current mindset concerning climate change has proved something of a trap, even for some scientists. The second part is an emergency medicine mindset to guide climate action. I will supplement that with tipping points. Part 3. This one is about why emissions reduction is insufficient, why we must also remove the excess carbon dioxide from the atmospheric circulation in the next 20 years. Part 4. The Urgent Project. This provides an aspirational example of a Manhattan Project 2.0 aimed at restoring the 1960s climate and doing it before the global economy repeatedly crashes. That would likely be followed by a human population crash, one that could leave as many as 80 to 90 percent of humans dead, perhaps regionally, perhaps globally. The immediate cause of death would not often be overheating as such, but the usual four horsemen, famine, pandemics, resource wars, and civil wars that turn into genocides. Let me begin with a brief history of how fast climate can leap. This is the temperature record from an ice core into Greenland's depths. The time resolution is good enough in the last ice age to sometimes see winter and summer layers from a single year. One can often count the passing years, just as with tree rings for recent times. Those cores revealed what we now call abrupt climate change big jumps on the timescale of less than one decade, which the ocean bottom's busy worms had hidden from view. The sharp shifts turned out not to be confined to the North Atlantic's climate, as smaller glitches about the same time can be found worldwide, though some go the opposite direction, as when the South Atlantic Ocean warms when the North Atlantic cools. There are several dozen of these quick climate shifts in the 100,000-year span of our last ice age, mostly between 60,000 years ago and our most recent one, called the Younger Dryas. It was named for an arctic flower that didn't do well in warmer climates, so it was a surprise to find it in silted up pond bottom in Denmark. The Younger Dryas period began with a fast cooling at 12,900 years ago and terminated in an exceptionally rapid rewarming, about 11,600 years ago. The jump down, from a warmer and wetter climate into a cooler and drier one, lasted 13 centuries. That was long, most abruptly rewarmed within a few centuries. Say, 10 generations of our ancestors. 
from 60,000 to 11,600 years ago was a period of whiplash climate changes, with transitions between cool and dry into warm and wet taking a mere five years. Most episodes lasted a few centuries and recurred perhaps 2,500 years later. This is also the period known in archaeology as the creative explosion for the new figurines and cave art, sewing needles, sandals, and trade routes that bespeak planning abilities. Those two big, prolonged dips 70 to 80,000 years ago may have reduced the human population to near extinction. Homo sapiens became an endangered species for a while, at least in southern Africa where geneticists and archaeologists estimate only a thousand people remained. That's the population of two big apartment buildings around here in Seattle. That history, plus 60 years of hanging around a medical school picking up on how physicians think about closing windows of opportunity, is what I bring to this overview of the climate threat. It did give me a somewhat different take on our climate problem than that of the climate scientists' standard emphasis on emissions, which cause overheating, and so we need to diet via annual emissions reduction. Annual emissions reduction is sometimes called decarbonization. Alas, about half of the dry weight of anything organic is the element carbon. Decarbonization sounds like a weight loss scheme, a rather fatal one as everything living involves the element carbon, not just the hydrocarbons. Who invents those inept names? Restating the climate problem as extreme weather in this first talk is a bit scary, once you realize that climate action, if it is to be effective, needs to happen very quickly, before we are too weakened to do anything. That leads me to three more talks on what to do about it. We have done big and quick projects before, such as the four-year Manhattan Project of World War II, the Man on the Moon program of the 1960s, and the crash program for a vaccine in 2020. I will show a path to doing something big about these new climate threats. I'm not proposing a particular fix, but rather a path to a goal. Our climate problem has fossil fuel CO2 emissions as its root cause. That accounts for two-thirds of the overheating. Methane, nitrous oxides from agriculture, making cement, and land clearing, taken together, add another third. Climate also has knock-ons such as extreme weather. These secondary processes may threaten civilization on a much faster time scale than does the underlying overheating. That vulnerability is the major point that I wish to get across in these talks. It is what makes climate an emergency. This is just in case that phrase knock on cause sounded unfamiliar. Medicine is mostly concerned with a chain of secondaries, even if a root cause is understood. Climate scientists are only beginning to address such climate secondaries as extreme weather. They are not, by training, concerned with interventions. Who would have taught them? There are no climate doctors or climate engineers. These talks attempt to get us organized. Organized to intervene in time. Today, I evaluate the risk landscape, which, incidentally, is what my father did. In running an insurance company, he had to price the premiums charged for taking on the risk. This slide on falling dominoes shows where we are going in parts 3 and 4. Our climate problem has fossil fuel carbon dioxide emissions as its root cause. The greenhouse gas excess creates knock-ons, such as ocean acidification and extreme weather. Medicine is mostly concerned with knock-on chains of secondaries, not with root causes. Climate scientists and other basic scientists are not, by training, concerned with interventions, as are MDs and PhD medical scientists like me, who tend to look upon each knock-on cause as another chance to intervene, as in that 10-step chain of infection for malaria. To preview the last talk in this series of four, here is how I imagine the relevant row of knock-ons and identify three types of interventions, those yellow posters. 1. Emissions Reductions a category that contains almost every strategy you have heard about. 2. A cleanup of the carbon dioxide already in the air. And 3. Bouncing incoming sunlight back out into space. The root cause of overheating, extreme weather, and ocean acidification may be the emissions rate, but reducing annual emissions via carbon diets is now far too slow, however logical the reasoning back in the 1970s. We now need a cleanup, removing the 50% excess of carbon dioxide. 
and it may take reflecting sunlight near the North Pole to buy us some time to do this cleanup, while the small halo will not cool us globally, just the high Arctic, that might reduce the craziness of the polar jet stream, which I will discuss next time. But the main overhead. We need global scale scrubbers, functioning like the scrubbers on submarines and the International Space Station. In the last talk, I will go through the design criteria for a Manhattan Project 2.0. There are several dozen cleanup proposals out there. This checklist will eliminate most of them. None promise to be big enough to even counter the continuing annual emissions of 44 gigatons of CO2 equivalents. They will not cool us off. Even in combination, they are unlikely to fix much. The timeline of such a cleanup project is going to be very important to us, so here is the last slide of part 4, just to show you where we are going. It is the fastest cleanup that I can imagine, an appropriate goal for us, now that dragging our feet hasn't stopped the runaway train of climate collapse. Whatever the method that we pick to scrub the 50% excess of carbon dioxide from the air and ocean surface waters, it will take at least 4 years to organize the project. To design something better than the several dozen existing schemes. To prototype the scrubbers and test them, and then. Another 5 years to deploy enough of them to finish the job by 2040. Cooling does not begin until annual scrubbing exceeds the continuing annual emissions, both from fossil fuels and from higher surface temperatures baking the surface soils, so that they decompose and release carbon dioxide, even without more fossil fuel carbon dioxide and methane. My focus is not merely on the ballooning list of expensive disasters, on which the remainder of this first lecture focuses. In the following three talks, it will be on what to do about it, and how quickly. That requires reconceptualizing the climate problem, perhaps by adapting the medical mindset for dealing with emergencies. So much for the series intro. Now we start on part one the sustained surges in five types of extreme weather, that began between 2002 and 2010. Let us start with big wind. Here is last year's extreme weather, but only counting the episodes that exceeded a billion US dollars in damage. There were 13 such severe windstorms last year, a record number. That's a count of only the inland windstorms, as NOAA, pronounced NOAA, sets hurricanes aside for their own category, and last year that added another seven. So, 20 is 6 times above the combined big wind baseline of 3.25 per year. Record numbers, but at least there were no billion dollar floods last year. The year before, 2019. It had 3 billion dollar floods and lots of smaller ones. The first two big floods were from the same knock on source. This monster rearrangement of wind and rain is of the type known as a bomb cyclone. The name is because it can suddenly appear within several days' time. No 10-day warning, as we now give for hurricanes forming in the North Atlantic Ocean. A derecho also puts in a surprise appearance, unless you listen to the local news every hour. This 2019 bomb cyclone on May 13 caused the billion-dollar flood on the Missouri River on May 14. And, on the 15th, another billion-dollar flood occurred on the Mississippi River. Not much warning was possible, nothing like the advance notice we usually get when floods come from prolonged rainfall. For example, there may be little time to drain reservoirs along the flood path, increasing the chance of the fast flood overtopping a dam, which usually destroys it. So, how do those numbers of big floods compare to the previous 40 years? I'd lump together the first 30 years into a baseline, averaging $1 billion flood every two years. About 2010, things shifted. For the most recent 10 years, we averaged triple that baseline number. So, remember 2010 for when the flood numbers surged. Next up, windstorms. From floods we go to the 40-year history of severe windstorms episodes. An episode is typically a long day of many tornadoes, but some are big hailstorms. That does not count hurricane-related winds, only the big episodes that arise from occluded fronts between cool dry arctic air masses and the warm and wet air masses from the tropics. That's what sets up spiraling. Derechos managed to do a lot of damage without spiraling winds. Derecho is Spanish for the straight winds, 
named in 1888 from the one studied in Iowa by a Danish-educated physics professor. For 1980 through about 2007, it is easy to define a baseline of five severe inland windstorm episodes every four years. From 2008 through 2015, it is six per year, a 380% increase. So, remember 2008 is the start of the surge. But note that 2016 and after is nine per year, which is 620% above baseline. You'd think that would be enough to convince climate deniers that something big is happening. Now look at last year's windstorms. It had 13 severe windstorm episodes. If it turns out to be a sustained jump, that will be 10 times baseline or a 900% increase. Here are four derechos that occurred on four successive days in July 1995. The second one started in Montana and kept going, after turning southeast, finished at the Ohio River. That's 1,300 miles, in about 22 hours at 60 miles per hour. Grand Rapids, Wisconsin, got hit three times in three days. The derecho last summer, the one that started near Omaha and ended in Indianapolis, was one of the $13 billion severe windstorm events last year. Wildfires are the result of the extreme weather that most often impacts the U.S. West Coast. This shows that Paradise Fire north of Sacramento in 2018, whose dirty orange smoke blanketed many West Coast cities, even Seattle. On the left is the Sierra Foothills town of Paradise, before the flames reached it. Note how strong those easterly winds are, very little smoke has pooled or spread sideways. We inhaled some of that smoke up here in Seattle, if you recall. That was the second of our stay-home summers, training for the stay-at-home year of 2020. The term fire weather was coined for when high winds add to the combination of two other extreme weather types, heat wave and drought. Veteran firefighters say that, compared to 2000, such triple combinations last much longer these days. NOAA has added firestorm damage to its database, working it up with corrections for inflation and again highlighting the billion-dollar big ones. No year has more than $1 billion fire but the number of skipped years varies. You can see that pre-2006 makes a good baseline, after that, the average is up 260%. I have also overlaid, that thin line, the cost of billion-dollar plus fires, and so we see the total annual costs are up 500% since 2014. Note also that the annual numbers of fires did not change. So, whatever is behind this surge, it is not the number of fires started. It is likely how long they last and how far they spread. Which suggests winds are worse, not careless campers or whether undergrowth was properly thinned. So, all of my data mining shows that we have three types of extreme weather surges that stayed. Severe floods beginning in 2010. Severe windstorms in 2008. Severe fire weather began in 2006. There are two more types of extreme weather to include in the Big Five. They do not have numbers great enough to establish baselines in the billion-dollar manner. Instead, these two have an orders of magnitude increase in severity, not merely 200% sustained jump in their numbers. They are the mega heat waves and stalled hurricanes. I'll explain those two illustrations shortly. So, how big is a mega heat wave? The 1995 Chicago heat wave started the same week as those four derechos I showed. The Chicago 1995 heat wave ended up killing 739, not 300. But that hot and humid event was not a mega. Megas were named for heat waves about a hundred times more severe. Two orders of magnitude. In fact, only a small portion of the excess deaths observed during heat waves are actually due to heat strokes from runaway inflammation. More die from respiratory or cardiovascular conditions worsened by high ambient temperatures. That leads to a lot of underreporting, as was the case in Chicago. Mega is more like 70,000 excess deaths in about a month's time, as occurred in Europe in 2003. That first mega was a real shock, overwhelming emergency hospitals, many understaffed because August is vacation month in France. 
In the aftermath, it was called an example of a black swan event. A statistically improbable event can nonetheless happen. But the black swan commentary is usually about how unlikely it is to happen again in our lifetimes, or even another thousand years. And therefore, some will reason, not worth preparing for, which might, after all, cost money, even, heaven forbid, raise our taxes next year. It was the same short-sighted reasoning that headed off preparing for a 1918-sized pandemic, the same as kept Texas from winterizing its power generation after a big freeze 10 years ago. Then, seven years later in 2010, came the second mega heat wave. This time, it was several time zones farther to the east, just south of Moscow. About 56,000 died within a few weeks. Were the black swan pundits embarrassed? Probably not. In my analysis, I am not dealing with category of one big episodes, only the types that have already repeated, and those orders of magnitude more severe. Besides mega heat waves, that category now includes stalled hurricanes. Note those intermediate rain bands on the radar, battering Houston, Violet Star, in 2017. The average forward speed on a hurricane's ground track is currently about 11 miles per hour over land. If its high wind footprint spanned 55 miles, it would take 5 hours to pass over a city. Unless, of course, it stalled as Hurricane Harvey did, delivering a year's worth of rain atop the storm surge that kept rain from draining off as usual. Take a look at how Harvey slowed, and then backed up. Those data points are all 6 hours apart, 4 in a day. The slower the forward speed, the more tightly packed the dots become. So, Houston may not have gotten the highest winds 130 miles off center, but it stayed within those intermediate rain bands for 5 days. Hurricanes that stalled. 2017 Harvey wasn't the first stalled hurricane though it did have the longest dwell time of 4.5 days, which I got by counting dots within the red circles, 200 kilometers across minus 125 miles, and multiplying by 6 hours. There were two other hurricanes with the same V reversal path as 2017 Harvey. 1968 unnamed, near Tampa, lingered 4.25 days, and 2002 on the Yucatan Peninsula for 3.25 days. 2018 Florence stalled for 2.7 days even without path reversal. I am taking 2002 Isidore as the beginning of 21st century stalled hurricanes. We now have five types of extreme weather that surged more than 200% in recurrence rate or severity in the first decade of the 21st century, starting in 2002, 2003, 2006, 2008, and 2010. None have fallen back, they are still sustained. That's the reason that climate action is now an emergency, because we must act before additional sudden shifts compromise our ability to act effectively, to cool things off a lot before 2040. Drought can create dust storms, as in the 1930s when my mother said that in Kansas City, it rained mud drops. They formed a brown polka dot pattern on the driveway. There is also no more evaporative cooling when soil gets so dry, that had been keeping the surface air a few degrees cooler. Once the soil dries out, plant leaves droop and expose the underlying soil to direct sunlight. Pretty soon, even the roots die and there is nothing to tap water that is deeper in the soil. Even if rainfall resumes, the infrastructure is gone and may take a decade to rebuild. Let me quote myself, from my 2008 book, Global Fever, from the University of Chicago Press. Suppose that I told you that, even without global fever, the chance of 21st century America suffering a century-long, widespread drought is 1 in 4. Speculation? No, such chances are what history tells us, the type of history written in thick or thin tree rings. Even without global fever's rearrangements, the Great Plains and the West have often suffered century-long droughts, far more widespread and long-lasting than the more familiar Dust Bowl of 1932-38. The drought map for 1934 is shown at the top, but that 1956 drought below it, while it covered a lot of ground, only lasted two years. 
The bottom map shows the current drought states. Here's the global situation, showing a climb that started about 1982, after which land temperature began rising 200% faster than ocean surface temperature. Note that drought differs from desert. Drought is a temporary reduction in a region's baseline soil moisture. The aridity of a desert is a low baseline soil moisture. Even a desert can suffer a drought. Between 1982 and 2000, global drought area doubled, decreasing the evaporative cooling of the surface, which had been reducing temperature. Back to the U.S. framework of billion-dollar episodes. The NOAA counts of billion-dollar drought episodes never exceed one per year, so we can judge by missed years, giving about one big drought every second year, increasing by half after about 2005. Again, I have overlain NOAA's curve for the annual cost. My catalog of troubles does not do justice to just how serious drought is likely to become, mostly because mine is an analysis of which varieties of extreme weather had a big surge within several years' time. My big five further filters by only including shifts that were sustained. And I use only the biggest episodes, in the billion dollar sense. The really important kind of drought events are those mega droughts seen in the tree ring records. How about billion dollar hurricane numbers, whether they stalled or not? For 40 years, about one per year, with no trend at all. Until the 41st year, 2020, when there were seven hitting the US. That's up sixfold from their baseline. That's the story for the five extreme weather types that surged in the 21st century, so far. Were the surges caused by global warming? Actually, they happened when it paused for 10 years. Their cause was the prior warming. But what is global warming? First of all, it only refers to the surface of the Earth, not its bulk. Global mean surface temperature is land and sea surface temperature averages, lumped together, two parts ocean to one part land. Global warming, or, as I prefer, global overheating, refers to the trend up in surface temps since 1977. It serves as a bookkeeping invention, rather like cash flow in financial analysis. It's an indicator of imbalance over time, not necessarily a feature of the planet's regulatory system, as if the planet had a central thermostat. This is the temperature record for the 30% of the Earth's surface that is land. I have reduced the usual 5-year smoothing to 4, as it better preserves those volcanic dips and the 10-year hiatus when the five types of extreme weather surged. The other puzzle period is 1950 until 1976. The carbon dioxide excess was steadily rising but the average temperatures were not, as if there were some automatic adjustment in the manner of air conditioning that countered it but had an upper limit in the mid-70s. Some climate scientists suggest that visible air pollution from smokestacks and vehicles, it reflects some sunlight back into space, was reduced by the 1970 Clean Air Act and the introduction of catalytic converters for cars. What I use instead of the global temp is this graph that shows land surface temperature separately from sea surface temperatures. Sea surface temps have been slid up about 9 degrees, so that the curves overlap in 1976. We can see that the ups and downs of the two temperatures track one another for a quarter century before 1976. Global mean surface temperature would be about one third of the way between them with ocean weighed twice as heavy as land, since only a third of the planet's surface is on terra firma. Both curves ramp up beginning in 1977 but go different directions after about 1984. As I mentioned, land warmed almost three times faster than the sea surface. Since land is where most of us live and work, why dilute the temperature rise with ocean temps? It just creates smaller numbers, and that misleads the public about the severity of our problem. Why land and sea differ is not obvious, it isn't differing heat capacities of land and water, given how well they tracked each other for 34 years before the 1984 divergence. I have used four-year running averages, as that preserves the hiatus that started about 2002, lasting 10 years, which 11-year running averages caused to disappear. However, all notions that global warming has stopped were ended by the steep rise that resumed in 2013. 
This is a good place to summarize the years when those five extreme weather surges occurred. Note that they all started within the 10-year hiatus. No one seems to know why. But carbon dioxide did not stop rising in the hiatus, it continued steadily up, unlike global temperature. So, what was the hidden player, which soaked up the added energy input for 10 years, so that it did not increase the kinetic energy of the air molecules, what we call its temperature? Might the added energy from increasing the carbon dioxide insulation during that 10 years have been diverted to other tasks? Perhaps the kinetic energy went into increasing the length of the jet stream, from 12,000 miles along a circular path to whatever length all those south dipping loops add on. That represents a lot of added momentum as well as kinetic energy. That's why there are murmurs of phase change afoot, like ice to water and water to humidity, each transition involving a temperature rise hiatus even though energy keeps pouring in. When I was a physics graduate teaching assistant, I used to teach those labs. It's not a settled issue in climate science, so far as I can tell, phase change would make a great thesis topic. Thank you for your attention. The other three talks in this series can be found on YouTube via the links at williamcalvin.com 2021. Until next time. Any questions?